Uh, we are in this series of messages called On Mission, and what we've learned is this, is that we all are trying to accomplish something, every one of us. And what we need to know is what our ultimate goal should be. Really, God created us for two goals. One is to love him, and the other is to love other people. That's why he brought us into existence. So really, that is what life is all about. It's about my having a relationship with God, a loving relationship, and my having a loving relationship with everyone who is around me. But we know that not everyone is like that. We know that not everyone loves God. We know that not everyone loves other people. And they're lost. They're looking for their way. They're trying to find some peace in their life, and they're trying to find meaning in their own existence. Well, they are lost, and God did something. He sent someone into our world, someone we've honored today in a really uh, cool way through the Lord's Supper. It was Jesus, and he came to seek out those people who were lost to help them find their way. Just as that was, that was his mission, it's also to be our mission as well. We've been talking about that every week, so on your outline sheet, I want you to write that down, that our mission is to seek and to save the lost. Jesus said that of himself that that was his mission statement. He referred to himself as the son of man. And he said the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. So I guess that's the question for us today. Are we seeking out people who haven't found their way? And are we helping them discover God, that he's a loving God who desires to know them? Well, obviously, we're supposed to be those type of people. What we want to do is we want to help people have what they need to survive. That's what it's about. It's about survival. It's about life. It's about experiencing that in a really amazing way. I want you to think about yourself in this way today as a server. Now, I talk about serving a lot, but when I say a server, I want you to put it in this context like you're a server in a restaurant, like you're waiting tables in a restaurant. So, what a server does is a server, a, a server goes up to the table and they serve them food. Now, my absolute favorite food to be served is something called bread. Do I have a witness out there from anybody? Anybody love that bread? Y'all were going against the keto and giving spiritual carbs. That was corny but cool right there, was it not? That's what we're supposed to do. In fact, when we look at the story of Jesus, bread is a really important part of it because he referred to himself as the bread of life. That he himself was the spiritual nutrition that we are to bring him into our lives so that we come alive and have a reason to live. So that's what we're going to learn about today. I'm going to ask you to take your Bible or you can look on your outline sheet or up on the screen as we read the scripture. Another encounter that Jesus had and is found in John chapter 6. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, you're looking for me not because you saw miraculous signs, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. On him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked him, well, what must, be, what must we do to do the works God requires? Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So they asked him, what miraculous sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our forefathers ate the manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Well, Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, it's not Moses who's given you the bread from heaven, but it is my father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, from now on, give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. He came for everyone. In fact, in the scripture, it talked about that he gives life to the world. And that's good news for every person in this room today because he wants all of us to experience many. He wants all of us to experience the joy that he created us to have. Well, I want to talk about uh, 
bread and the bread of life and how Jesus affects us and how it is that we become a server, really, as we wait on people to deliver something to them that they need. When you look at people in this world, there are two different types of people. There are spiritually, this is going to sound terrible, there are spiritually fat people, all right, and there are spiritually fit people, there are healthy people. Y'all, I'm not talking about any any body shape, okay? I have no room to say anything like that. Y'all, my love handles are getting so big, they're going like this. When a wind blows, I go faster like this when it blows them back. You know what I'm saying? It's bad. It's really bad. So I'm just putting that out there right now. We are either spiritually fat or we're spiritually healthy. So that's the first statement I want you to write down on your outline sheet because we need to know who needs the bread. We need to know who needs what it is that we serve. Well, as we look at the scripture, we know that there are people who do have this need. Let's give a description of those people who are spiritually fat. The fat are looking to satisfy their own desires. It's what, it's about them. It's the pleasure they experience in life. We look at the scripture in verse 30. It says this, so they asked him, what miraculous sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? This is a really amazing or amazing questions to me because Jesus had just come off a huge miracle. He had just fed 5,000 people with five loaves and two small fishes. Y'all, he gave everybody a fish sandwich. Okay, it's corny, but it's cool, right? That's exactly what he did. He gave them something to eat, and it was a miraculous event. And here they are again. Y'all, it's the same, a lot of the same people because he said, you just ate, and now you're over here asking for another miracle. He was, what these people were wanting was their fill. He said to them, you've had your fill. You've had it. But here they are again asking Jesus to do something else for them to fulfill another pleasure of their life or maybe the same pleasure of their life. It wasn't about God. It wasn't about Jesus and a relationship with him. It was about what it is that they desired in their life. And we know that's what happens for many people, that it become, becomes something about satisfaction that we're looking for and not a relationship that we're looking for. We need something that lasts forever. Look at the scripture in verse uh, 27. It's one of the verses we're going to look at a lot today. But in verse 27, the first part of it says this, do not work for food that spoils What Jesus was saying, you're out there looking for this satisfaction stuff, desiring these things, but y'all, that stuff does not last. What you're wanting to do is to use me, basically, to give you what you want. And here's the way in which we see that in this story. They asked him another question, what are the works that we need to do to get this? It was basically this approach. God, I'm going to do this so that you'll do this. It's the genie in the bottle approach, right? It's I'm going to rub this. I want you to come out and fulfill my wishes. And if it takes me doing certain things to get what I want from you, then I'll do it. That's one way and reason people look to God. And we see that in this story. But there's another reason why people look to God. They're going through difficult circumstances in their life. And they want help. And because of that, they're calling on God. I mentioned a study a couple of weeks ago about college students, and they did a survey of their beliefs about God, and many college students do believe in God, and they asked about when should should God be included in your life? What is your perspective of that? And one of the statements that they made was, God should be included in our lives when we have problems. And at least they had enough gall or, you know, boldness to say that, which basically is the way many people feel about it. I'm going to include God in my life when I have something that I can't deal with on my own. What I call these people are event believers. They go from event to event to event to event. There's a bad event, they call on God. Then they move away from God. There's a bad event, they call on God. Then they move away from God. And where do they go when they move away from God? They go and experience the worldly golden corral. Y'all... It's corny, but it's cool, all right? That's exactly what happens. You go and you experience all, all these things that, that, that are offered. I, I'll just 
I'll prove the point. How many of you, when you go to Golden Corral or uh, a buffet, overeat? Come on, honesty. Anybody out there? Y'all, I think every time I've gone, I, I can't think of a time that I really have not because there are just too many options. And y'all, you can fill up. They give you another clean plate. You can go up. There are all these clean plates that you can keep filling up. The other day, we, uh, it's about, I don't know, three weeks ago, uh, one of our Sunday school teachers had been teaching ever before I got here. I mean, for years and years and years, one of our senior adult teachers, and, and he was retiring from teaching, and somebody else was taking over the class, so we had a little celebration, their class did, and they had it at Golden Corral. So we went to have dinner at 3.30. Okay, this is what happens when you get a little bit older in your life. Okay, 3.30 in the afternoon. And y'all, I learned something about it. One of the, the guys, y'all, it's just wisdom. He just imparted wisdom in me. He said, I was about to go get some dessert. After I had two plates of other stuff, okay, I was about to go get dessert. He said, Tim, let me show you a trick. So he walked me up to the de- dessert bar. He said, don't get the dessert bowl. Get a salad bowl. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just like, aren't you grateful that I just shared? I just... I've taught you how to sin even more today. That's exactly what I've done. Get his elbow, and I filled that bad boy up. But what we do is we look at that, and it becomes so enticing to us that we want it, right? The things of the world become so enticing to us that we want it. Whatever kind of pleasure or whatever it is that we feel like is going to make us better. I mean, it, I've talked about all that, the power, our position in life, the, the things that we buy, all of those things go to replace God. Well, we need to be the healthy type of person. So on your outline sheet, let's fill in this next one. Those who desire health are looking to take in what they need. So it's not what they need to be satisfied. It's, it's what they need to have a meaningful life. I mentioned a couple of weeks ago about this as well, that uh, it's about relationships, that life is about relationships. I've already kind of said it because I told you that the goal of God is this, to, uh, to love God and to love others. That's his goal. Well, God is somebody we have a relationship with. Others is, they're people that we have relationships with. Life is all about relationships. That's why when we make a decision about something, we have to think, how is this decision going to affect my relationship with God, and how is this decision going to affect my relationship with other people, because that's how my life should be. It should be that there is peace and unity between both of these. So it's important for us to look at this and understand, what are my relationships like? Jesus put attention on that because he came to have relationships with people. Look at verse 27 again. It says, do not work for food that spoils. I already mentioned that. The next phrase says, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. In other words, here I am as a person, I want to know you, and I want to give you, relationship, something that you need in your life. What do we need? We all need love. Think about what I said before. Uh, The desire of God, to love God, love others. And it's not a temporary love, it's a love that lasts. As a matter of fact, love and eternal life go together. For God so Loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have what? Eternal life. God wants us to come alive. It's through Jesus that we come alive, that our sins are forgiven and that we have the spiritual breath of God within us. And that's what God desires for all of us, to be healthy in that way. Yet here are these guys, it was all about themselves. In verse 31, our forefathers, this is what they're saying to Jesus, our forefathers ate the manna in the desert as it's written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Here they go again. We want to eat, right? Bread from heaven. Once again, another thing against the keto diet. How can you not eat bread when they ate bread to survive? Do I have a witness out there from anyone? Y'all, I'm just trying to make any excuse so I can keep eating the bread. I know it works, but it's the best bread. Y'all, it's an awesome bread. It's the awesome bread of life that God gives us. And I want you to to, uh, think about it in this way because they're talking about manna from heaven. They were using that as like, God gave manna, so why don't you give us something? Do that as well. And then Jesus points her attention to what he did. God, God gave manna from heaven to save you, to keep you from dying so that you could live. God did that. 
And it was a precursor. It was something that would foretell what would happen in the future because God would one day provide the bread of life who would come into the world to save the people. That's what he was bringing attention to. You're talking about Moses. God's the one who brought manna. And God's the one who brings the bread of life. Look at the scripture. I love this. It's in verse uh, 35. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry. And he who believes in me will never be thirsty. We need to know who it is that needs the bread of life. We need to know the people who are spiritually fat, people who are living for the things of the world, who are, who are desiring to have hope within them. So that's where it starts. If we're going to serve people. We need to know what we need to serve them. Second thing I want to talk about is uh, what do we do to get them to want what it is that we're serving? Number two says this, we are to display bread that can make others healthy. To display the bread. Y'all, I just mentioned ago, it's great. It's the best bread that you will ever have in your life. Y'all, it's great bread. It's better than Caraba bread that you dip in the oil. And you would think it'd be spiritual because there's oil involved, right? It's better than that. It's better than, it's better than Olive Garden bread that you just like dip in the cheese sauce. It's better than Texas Roadhouse bread, y'all. That's a big story. It's better than anything that you could ever possibly think. It's better than Outback bread. Y'all can keep going on and on and on. It's better than anything that you can put in your mouth. Why? Because it brings joy in our life. You know what those other breads bring? Eater's remorse. That's what it brings. But the bread of life brings joy into us. I want to I wanna keep, I want to talk about this because you think I'm silly talking about this, but what God does is, or Jesus does, is he points the attention that it's the best bread that you can ever have. It's the real deal. As a matter of fact, it's something that has the seal of approval of God. The seal of approval, the best bread. Look at the scripture. It talks about that very thing in verse 27. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. Then it said, on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. It's the best thing that you could ever have. He, Jesus, is the real deal, and we are to be the real deal as well. Did you know that Betty Crocker, the one with the famous cookbook, never existed. Never existed. Betty Crocker came about because of a contest that they did, this flour mill company, to be able to have an advertising campaign. She never existed. Y'all, did you know that Aunt Jemima never existed? <laughs> never, the best served in, in the world, never existed. Also, came about in the late 1800s. Another flour mill did it so that they can, can make money. Get this one. Did you know, this is just astonishing to me, did you know that Duncan Hines, who was a food critic and interviewer, never made a cake professionally? <laughs> How can that even possibly be? It's a real person who never did what he was selling. Never did it. Let me tell you something. There may be a Betty Crocker and Aunt Jemima who never existed, but Jesus did. Jesus did exist. And there may be a Duncan Hines who did exist, but never made a cake. But we have a Jesus who existed and went into the world to be the hands and feet of God so that people may know him. Duncan Hines can be somebody who talks big about, hey, you can eat this cake, or brownies, by the way. They're really good as well, all right? You can eat this cake. You can eat this brownie, but never did it himself. And that's the way it is, believe it or not, for many Christians. We talk about God. We talk about this. We talk about that, and we don't do it. We don't go out and become servers. We don't go out to the people who are spiritually fat. We don't go out to meet the needs of people who need something to bring them alive. So I want to ask you a question. Are you the real deal? The real deal is somebody who does, doesn't just talk. 
And as we look at our life, we need to see the same thing. Y'all, we're putting who we are on display. I, I keep talking about restaurants, and, uh, but one of the things that is one of the, the biggest temptations for me is you have a meal and they bring out that dessert cart, you know, that's got all the desserts on it. And I have the hardest time not eating one of those desserts. More often than not, I will get one of those desserts and I will get Jennifer to share it with me to make me feel better about myself. What I just did was I'm Satan because I led her to sin along with me, okay? I got her involved in my bad behavior. And that, that's what we do sometimes. But it's something that's on display that becomes so desirable for us that we have to have. I want you to put it in this way. So you've got two plates. You've got the dessert plate. It's got all these things that are fattening. These are spiritual fatness, things of the world. And then you've got another plate, but there's only one thing on that plate. It's bread. So I can choose all these spiritually fat things, or I can choose this one thing, bread. Now, I'll be honest with you. I love bread, but if I had an option many times to start with dessert, I would. Anybody else? I, I do the same thing. It's a huge temptation to me, but you've got all these temptations of dessert, and you've got this one thing of bread. What we have to do is to display that. Dis display why you would want this instead of those worldly things. Well, how do we do that? On your outline sheet, I want to give you just a few quick things about how we put Jesus, the bread of life, on display. The first two have to do with really what's behind the scenes that cause us to behave in a certain way. The first one is this, our thoughts. So on your outline sheet, fill that in. It's, it's our thoughts. Uh, we think about others. Our thoughts, that's what it's related to. It's about relationships. It's what we think about others. So if I think positively about others, my thoughts lead to my motives. So now I have a motive, because I'm thinking positively, I have a motive. On your outline sheet, fill it in. Our motives are what we want to do to influence others. This is what Jesus did to influence us, but it's what we want to do to influence others, to influence them in a positive way. So I've got these thoughts that lead to these motives. Okay, I want to influence them in a positive way. And then we see how it's displayed on the plate through that bread. These are the ingredients of the bread. First of all, it's our attitudes. It's one of help and not judgment. That they know, I want to help you. I don't want to judge you. Here's the second ingredient. It's words. It's words of encouragement and not condemnation. No matter what you've done to someone else or to me, I still want to encourage you. Another one, another ingredient is actions. To do what's best for them, even at the expense of ourself, requiring sacrifice. When people see that, they know what love really looks like. Here's the last one. It's emotions. And emotions have to do with our life of joy. They see a person displayed before them who may have gone through difficult circumstances, but they still experience joy in their life in the midst of those difficult circumstances. That's what happens to us. And when people see that, they want it. That looks too good to turn down. We're serving that on a plate to them. Well, at least we're supposed to. But as I mentioned, there are other people in the world who are still into their selfishness, even Christians. Uh, often we turn back to the things of the world and what we're showing to people. It's not the bread of Jesus. It's not what life looks like when you love him. It's what life looks like when you're trying to find your sense of happiness through things that spoil. They spoil and what we need something is something that lasts for eternal life. Third thing, okay, I, kind of following a progression here. First of all, we got to know who's spiritually fat, who needs what we offer. The second thing, which is the bread of life, this, Jesus, the second thing we need to do is to put it on display so that people want it, they desire it, it's like it's too good to turn down. And the third thing that we have to do is to, to offer it to them. It's to give it to them. It says this in number three, we are to offer the bread that gives life. We're to offer it to them. How do they accept it? I mean, how do they receive it? Okay, here it is. I'm offering it to you, but they have to make the decision to take it so they can consume it for it to be a part of them. How does that happen? Two times in the scripture it talked about it. One, in verse 35, it says, Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry. Listen, and he who 
believes in me will never be thirsty. You have to believe in it. In verse 29, it's not on your outline sheet. You may just want to write that reference. Verse 29, it said this, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. The way I accept it is I believe that I need it and I trust in it as the foundation for my life. What must I believe? Quickly, on your outline sheet, these are things that we have to believe to receive the bread of life. First of all, I must believe there is one God who created me to do good. What did God create me for? To love God and to love other people. There's one God, one creator God, amen? A lot of other gods have been created, but there's one God who created us. The second thing that we must believe, I must believe I have a problem that I always, that I don't always do good. I don't always do good. I'm in that basket. Anybody in there with me? We don't always do good. God created me for that purpose, but I don't always treat people the way I, I want to be treated. Here's the third thing that we need to believe. I must believe that Jesus always does good. Are you following a pattern here? Jesus always does good. Everything he did, he did, listen, because of his thoughts about mankind, because his motive was to influence them in a positive way, his attitude was to encourage them and not discourage them, his actions were to help them overcome their difficulties, his words were to be words that would build people up and not tear them down, is to live a life of joy in front of them no matter what. That's what Jesus did. All of that's good. Here's another one. It says this, that I must believe Jesus did good for me. It's personal. What did he do good for me? I talked about this just a moment ago. Our actions, our actions sometimes are such loving actions that we would give of ourselves, that we would sacrifice ourselves for the good of others. What did we just celebrate a little while ago in the Lord's Supper? The death of Jesus, his broken body and his shed blood. He gave his life as a sacrifice for us, for our sin. Y'all, we don't do good. Jesus did good to show us what it was like, and he did good for us by taking our sin, dying on the cross for the sins of our life, the sins we deserve punishment for, for dying for those sins so that we could be forgiven and to know him. He did that for me. And what I have to know is that I need the forgiveness that he offers. So that goes into the next thing. I must confess not doing good and asking for forgiveness. I must confess, God, I, I don't do good. I do sin in my life. I do things for my benefit and not the benefits of others. And I need you to forgive me. Restoration, restoration comes in relationships. Yeah, we're talking about relationships. Restoration comes in relationships when? There is forgiveness. Restoration does not happen without forgiveness. Because if there's wrong behavior, there's something that always stands between. I'm just talking about regular relationships. There's always something that stands between us. So there has to be forgiveness to move past behavior. And that's why in our relationship with God, we have to acknowledge our sin our bad behavior to God in order for it to be forgiven in our coming to know God and for us to experience the bread of life within us. Here's another one. It's the last one. I give evidence of what I believe through doing good. All right, as a Christian, this is what happens. I'm, my thoughts now have changed. I have the thoughts of God. My motives have now changed. I want the best for other people. My attitudes have now changed. I want to encourage and not discourage. My actions have now changed. I want to help people, not hurt people. My words have now, now changed. I'm a builder, and I'm not, I'm not somebody who tears down. And my life has changed. Why? Because my life is a life of joy. There's a reason. We took the bread off the plate. That's what we're supposed to be offering. If you're a Christian today, at one time, you received it. You took Jesus into your life. And we've got to make sure that we continue to deliver that to other people. 
instead of being people who talk but don't do because their doing is about the desserts on the fattening plate. <laughs>